All right, for chapter 8.1 on metabolism, we want to be able to look out for a few things, including how enzymes work, so how they do their job, and also how different inhibitors affect those enzymes. So how do enzymes actually work? Well, they speed up reactions by lowering the activation energy. So that's a really important term that you need to know. And here's an important diagram that you should definitely be aware of. So they don't change the reaction or the products, what they do is they lower the amount of energy necessary to get a reaction started. And they do that by doing one of two things. They either place molecules in the correct orientation or they can weaken bonds um, between substrates. So that's how they work. Um, how an enzyme actually fits with its substrate can be explained in two different ways. So old school, um, we thought the enzymes kind of worked like a lock and a key, like they had a fixed shape and that that substrate just fit right into that shape. Now we think that enzymes really work using what we call the induced fit model. So induced fit means that when the substrate binds with the active site on the enzyme, it forms an enzyme substrate complex, which is a little bit different in shape than the naked enzyme itself. So you can kind of see how the enzyme hugs around that substrate. Now, that doesn't mean that enzymes can fit any substrate. Each enzyme is still specific to its substrate. It's just a little bit of a different way of thinking about these enzymes. All right, so when we have enzymes, we also need to find a way to inhibit them. And inhibit basically means to stop something. So all of these metabolic reactions happening in our cells are very important, but we don't want them to happen in a fashion that is out of control or without any means of regulation. So oftentimes we'll use inhibitors to prevent a reaction from occurring until we need it again. There are three types of inhibition that you need to know. And the first one is what we call competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibitors resemble the substrate. So they're kind of like imposters. So they have a shape that is similar to the shape of the regular substrate. And because they have that similar shape, they're able to fit into this active site on the enzyme. So this is exactly how certain sulfonamide antibiotics work. Um, what you do to your body when you take a sulfonamide is you're basically taking an enzyme inhibitor that's necessary for the production of folic acid in bacteria. All cells, human cells included, need folic acid. It's just that humans, we usually absorb it in the form of a vitamin. Bacteria can't do that, so they have to synthesize their own folic acid, and to do that, they need an enzyme. Well, sulfonamide antibiotics work as a competitive inhibitor for the substrate that bacteria use to make um, that folic acid. So if the bacteria isn't able to make folic acid anymore, we're inhibiting a part of its mole, uh, metabolic process, which is exactly how antibiotics work. So again, we need to remember that these competitive inhibitors actually fit into the active site because that's a little bit different than the next type of inhibition. Non-competitive inhibition, on the other hand, um, is a little bit different. It does have a different name, so you are allowed to call it either name. You can either call it non-competitive or you can call it allosteric inhibition. IV doesn't care what you call it. You're expected to recognize both terms. So sometimes in a prompt or a question, they'll use the word non-competitive. Sometimes they'll use allosteric uh, inhibition. Both of them have merits um, in their name. So we want to remember that allosteric inhibitors bind to something called the allosteric site. And the allosteric site is some spot away from the active site. So it's not the active site itself, it's this other spot over here. When an allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor binds to that allosteric site, it changes the shape of the active site so that the substrate is no longer able to bind. So it's not this competitive inhibitor sitting in the active site, it's actually changing the shape of the active site, again, by binding to that allosteric site. 
So an example of this um, is how sarin gas works. So sarin gas affects our ability to destroy the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So here's a good either preview or review, depending on where you're at, of some chapter 11 stuff. Um, but at the end of these motor neurons that join with a muscle, you're gonna find neurotransmitters um, called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine uh, is released from the presynaptic Synaptic neuron and it binds with a receptor on a muscle cell. When that acetylcholine binds with that receptor, it's going to initiate a muscle contraction. Now, we don't want that muscle to contract all of the time, so usually we send in this enzyme called acetylcholinesterase or ACHE to destroy that acetylcholine so that it's no longer giving the impulse for um, contraction. Well, sarin gas is going to block that cholinesterase, so it is going to become an allosteric inhibitor on this enzyme. Then this enzyme can't catalyze the destruction of acetylcholine, so it's going to sit here in the synapse and cause constant contractions. Now, if that doesn't sound so bad, um, I don't know, constant muscle contraction, whatever. Well, let's think about this. <laughs> Things like your diaphragm, if your diaphragm is in constant contraction, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna inhibit your ability to breathe. Um, and then of course, all other kinds of physiological problems. So again, all about inhibiting those enzymes. Last type of inhibition that you need to know is called end product inhibition. And end product inhibition really affects an entire metabolic pathway, not a single enzyme. Okay, so remember metabolic pathways involve multiple enzymes, each creating an intermediate before we get to the end product. A great example here is the pathway that converts threonine into isoleucine. So threonine is an amino acid that we can eat, and then our body can convert that to isoleucine. So isoleucine is not an essential amino acid. We don't have to eat it because we can actually make it using this metabolic pathway. So here's threonine, it fits in with this first enzyme, and then it goes through all of these stages and turns into isoleucine. But let's say we already have enough isoleucine. I don't want any more. Okay, well, once this product reaches a high enough concentration, it becomes an allosteric inhibitor to the first enzyme in the chain. So if this first enzyme in the chain now has an active site that doesn't fit the substrate, it is now inhibited, and if I stop the first enzyme, then I've stopped this whole chain. So it's a great way to make sure that you don't produce too much of a product um, to have that product inhibit that first enzyme. And so again, once this concentration falls, it will release from that allosteric site and this pathway can get started again. So let's do a little review um, from standard level on just enzymes in general. So there are three enzyme graphs that you have to know. You have to know the relationship between enzyme activity and pH. Again, not all enzymes have an optimal pH um, in this zone, um, but all of them have the general shape like this, including denaturation on either end. Then you have um, the effect of temperature, so reactions get faster as it gets warmer just because the increased kinetic energy and they're colliding, those molecules are colliding with more energy. And then after our optimal temperature, that rate tends to fall because of denaturation. And then the last graph that you have to know is the effect of substrate concentration. So when you increase the substrate concentration, that reaction is gonna get faster and faster, but eventually it levels off or plateaus. And the reason for that being, um, in the beginning, if there's very few substrates and a lot of enzymes, you know, it's kind of slow, those enzymes trying to find those substrates and catalyze that reaction. When I add more substrates, okay, that reaction gets faster. But eventually, if I add even more substrates, all of those active sites on my enzymes are already occupied. So adding even more substrates won't help me. So all enzymes are gonna follow this general pattern. But what happens when I add an inhibitor? Well, it depends on what type of inhibitor you're adding. Again, here is your uninhibited enzyme. So a regular enzyme, no inhibitor going up in speed and then plateauing. 
When you add a competitive inhibitor, like up here, again, that competitive inhibitor is sitting in that active site instead of the real substrate. So at first, it's going to be a little bit slower than the uninhibited enzyme. However, as you increase the substrate concentration, because I have so many more substrates in comparison to the competitive inhibitor, it becomes more likely that the real substrate will bind with the enzyme instead of the competitive inhibitor. So eventually, if I increase this substrate concentration enough, I can get back up to full speed, okay? The same as the uninhibited enzyme. When I add an allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor though, things are a little bit different. I'm never gonna reach that full speed no matter how many more substrates I add, and here's why. When you add something to that um, allosteric site, you are changing the site of the active site or the shape of the active site, and that substrate isn't gonna be able to bind with the enzyme. So it, again, doesn't matter how many of the real substrates you add, if they can't bind with the active site, we're never gonna get this enzyme to work, okay? So this is a typical shape of a graph. We see this graph question a lot, um, identifying which type of enzyme inhibitor is causing which change in the rate of reaction. So this is one that you'll definitely want to know. All right, so um, speaking of applications of enzyme inhibitors, um, one of the new malarial drugs is very interesting in that field, um, and that's because the old kind of traditional malarial drugs like quinine-based um, are becoming less effective because that malarial parasite is becoming increasingly resistant to those. So to find a new way to combat this really devastating diseases, um, biologists have figured out, okay, well, I want to inhibit enzymes that are specific to the parasite's metabolism. So kind of the same way that antibiotics work, inhibiting bacterial metabolism without affecting human metabolism, scientists want to find a way to do that with the parasite's metabolism. So the way that they're doing this is actually really clever. They're using something called bioinformatics. And bioinformatics is a field in which we use computers to build models based on large amounts of data. So they can actually create an image of a protein or an enzyme, and then they can screen hundreds of thousands of chemicals um, for different fits within the allosteric sites or the active sites of these enzymes. So instead of me as a biologist having to sit in my lab and try one chemical and then another chemical and then another one, these computers can process large experiments, large numbers of experiments to determine effectiveness. So kind of a cool thing there. Okay, so let's revisit those um, questions that we talked about in the beginning. So one of the ones we wanted to look out for was explaining the effect of inhibitors. Again, that's an eight mark question. That's huge. So you wanna talk about how inhibitors reduce enzyme activity or the rate of the reaction. I know that seems uh, self-explanatory, but write it anyways. Then I would break your question down into the types of inhibitors. So we have competitive inhibitors, which have a similar shape. They bind to the active site. They are competing with the regular substrate. You can also talk about an example. That's just a good strategy in general to always name an example. And again, here we see something about mentioning that graph, okay? So um, you can also get marks here for drawing that enzyme inhibition graph and labeling it, always a nice idea. All right, and then we can then transition into talking about non-competitive inhibitors. So they're not the same shape as the substrate. Um, they bind to the allosteric site. They change the shape of the active site. You can give an example. So we talked about sarin gas. Um, heavy metals or things like cyanide are also non-competitive inhibitors. Sarin gas would work fine there though also. Um, and then you could talk about, again, either showing the graph or talking about the graph that increasing the substrate concentration um, doesn't really reduce the effect of the inhibitor. You're not going to see a third category for end product inhibition, and that is because end product inhibitors are a type of allosteric inhibition. So remember that end product becomes an allosteric inhibitor of the first enzyme, so it's kind of lumped in here. 
All right, so let's talk about how enzymes actually work. I think that seven marks is kind of scary here because it doesn't seem like there's a lot to write about, but I promise you there is. So first of all, in enzymes increase the rate of reaction, and at the end of that reaction, they remain unchanged. They're ready to rock and roll again. They lower activation energy, and look, you get another mark if you can define activation energy, so that's nice. Um, if you can draw that annotated graph, you know the one that looks like this, where you have the reaction with the enzyme, or sorry, without the enzyme, and then another one with the enzyme, and then you remember, you have to label that and annotate it to get that mark, but that's always kind of a good starting spot. Um, you can say that the substrate joins with the enzyme at the active site to form the enzyme substrate complex. So look, those are two different marks. Um, the enzyme is specific for a particular substrate, so lactase only breaks down lactose, etc. Um, enzymes bring reactants closer together, so they put them in the correct orientation. You would have also gotten marks if you said that. You can talk about how the induced fit model, again, um, causes a change in the shape of the enzyme when the substrate binds. Um, making the substrate more reactive. So again, I know this is a little bit intimidating, seven marks here, just even if they sound stupid, okay? Even if it sounds like a no-duh statement, write it anyways.